The Tom Woods Show, episode 791. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you missed the Contra Cruise, a week of hilarity and tremendous fun at sea with Bob Murphy and me, well, check out the highlight video and just maybe a link to future cruises. Check it out at ContraCruise.com. Folks, just about everyone would like to earn an additional income stream or even their entire income online. Well, I've been doing it for years and years, and I can teach you exactly what I do. I can show you all different ways to monetize a website, whether linking to affiliate products that are related to what you talk about, or starting your own podcast, or self-publishing a book, or blogging. I can take you step by step through all of it in my free ebook, Five Paths to an Online Income. Check it out at pathstoincome.com or text the word PROSPER to the number 44222. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. We're talking today about... I believe it's Major General Smedley Butler, who is the author of the great short little work, War is a Racket. A lot of libertarians know about that work, and it's interesting coming from a man like Smedley Butler. And joining me to talk about him is C.J. Kilmer, who hosts the Dangerous History podcast. He's known as Professor C.J., We'll, t we'll get you the links to that in just a minute. This podcast combines history and libertarianism in a way I've not seen done anywhere. And as you will see, the archive of this podcast is really just a treasure trove of wonderful, wonderful listening. So I want to urge you to check that out. And let's get chatting about our subject today. CJ, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tom. It's great to be here. Uh, to be on the Tom Woods Show it, for a libertarian content creator is sort of like being invited on the Tonight Show when you're a comedian. So I'm absolutely stoked to talk to you. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, let's hope that you know. I would I would say that maybe you're Seinfeld, but you've already produced so much content on your podcast. Now, I want to talk about, of course, Smedley Butler. We'll get to that. But first, let's talk about the fact that you have had a successful libertarian podcast for years now, and you have produced a lot of episodes, and that interests me too. And it also interests a lot of people who listen, so people who say, we, we kind of also would like you to pull the curtain back on your own operation and tell us how you do this. I mean, I've produced almost 800 episodes. People are curious about that. Well, I'm curious about your situation. You have degrees in history, and you've been teaching history, and then at some point you decided you were going to do – a podcast. How did that come about? Right. Well, I've been teaching history for um, over 10 years now. I, I have a bachelor's and master's in history, no PhD, though, uh, for a variety of reasons, kind of uh, quit while I was behind on that. But um, actually never even got rolling on it. But anyway, um, a couple of years ago, I decided to start a podcast. And it was in part because I wanted to be able to delve into topics even more deeply than I do in my classes because I teach it basically kind of what used to be called a community college. So most of the classes I teach are kind of intro survey classes. And just because of time, you know, you can't delve too deeply into any one topic really. And so – but, you know, I'm always reading, I'm always researching, I'm always learning new stuff, and I had all these cool things that I wanted to share with my classes or get into more detail. And so I eventually started to learn kind of the rudimentaries of podcasting because I would make little podcasts for my students as supplemental materials that we have Blackboard as like our online supplemental system. And I would put little podcasts, you know, usually like 15 minutes long or something in there as supplements. And they weren't terribly good, but it was a learning process. And so after a while, I started my own show because I wanted something that was mine and where I was completely in creative control, where I could, you know, one week talk about the Bronze Age if I felt like it, and the next week talk about something really recent if I felt like it and really kind of have no boundaries, no restrictions. And the other thing was I was a podcast junkie for a bunch of years as a listener, and I realized that there wasn't a podcast out there that was the podcast that I really was looking for. And so I kind of realized at that point I had to make it myself. There weren't any good podcasts that I was aware of that were 
basically libertarian anarchist history podcasts. You know, there's a lot of great libertarian podcasts. There are great history podcasts. And, you know, there are shows like yours where you talk to lots of historians and you certainly talk about historical topics. But as far as like a pure straight up history podcast with a lot of narratives and all that kind of stuff, often long form, it wasn't out there. So I decided to make it. And um, for my little niche, I've kind of got the market cornered. So I've developed a bit of a cult following, I guess. I've had a number of people request to have you on. And I thought, okay, at some point, I'm going to figure out what would be a good topic for us. Then when I looked at the episode topics you have, I thought, well, pfft, the problem now is figuring out which, which one to choose out of all these. It's no, <laughs> no real problem figuring out what to talk about. So let's shift then and talk about – well, tell people, first of all, the website. Sure. The website is profcj.org, P-R-O-F-C-J.org. But you can also put in dangeroushistorypodcast.com, which is the name of the show. It's longer, but it's probably easier for people to remember. So dangeroushistorypodcast.com. What I thought we'd do today is talk about the subject of one of your recent episodes. And since you know much more about this than I do, I'm going to let you – I'm going to put you in the driver's seat, in effect, sure. from here on. And that has to do with – and is it Major General Smedley Butler? I'm doing that from memory. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, the rank he was at when he retired. Okay. So I want to talk about him because he's the author of a classic work that I know a lot of libertarians like, but he's not writing entirely as a libertarian. He has – you know, he's got his own set of views, but how can you resist something called war is a racket? Right. And especially with somebody – like him, who reached that rank, for him to come out and say it's all a racket, of course, gets your attention. If I write a book saying war is a racket, people say, well, of course, Woods is going to see that, say that. There's no pleasing that guy. But when Major General Smedley Butler says that, well, you sit up and take notice. So uh, let, let's tell us something about the biography of this guy. What do we know about him? And do we know anything about the moment his mind changed about all this? Okay. Well, um, if I may, I can I can share with you a quote from another essay he wrote roughly around the same time period as War is a Racket, in which he sums up what he thought of his own career in the Marine Corps, looking back on it once it was over. He was a Marine Corps officer for over 30 years. He joined the Marine Corps on the eve of the Spanish-American War and served until, I think, 1931 thereabouts. It was during the Hoover presidency that he quit. And um, saw action all over the world, highly decorated, two medals of honor, many other high uh, decorations. This was really a Marine's Marine and a guy who wasn't one of those polished um, kind of armchair officers or anything like that. This was a guy who learned his trade on the job. He was able to get a commission as an officer in the Marine Corps despite the fact that he never set foot in college a day in his life as a student. And back then, there actually were a few avenues where you could, could you be, could become a Marine Corps officer without even going to college. Obviously, that has long since gone as an opportunity. But anyway, these are his words in a 1935 um, article he wrote for a magazine called Common Sense. He writes, I was a racketeer. It may seem odd for me, a military man, to adopt such a comparison. Truthfulness compels me to. I spent 33 years and four months in active service as a member of our country's most agile military force, the Marine Corps. I served in all commissioned ranks from second lieutenant to major general. And during that period, I spent most of my time being a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street, and for the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer for capitalism. I suspected I was just part of the racket at the time. Now I am sure of it. Like all members of the profession, I never had an original thought until I left the service. My mental faculties remained in suspended animation while I obeyed the orders of the higher-ups. This is typical of everyone in the military service. Thus, I helped make Mexico, and especially Tampico, safe for American oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba, a decent place for the National Citibank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. The record of racketeering is long. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for American sugar interests. I helped make Honduras right 
for American fruit companies. In China in 1927, I helped see to it that the Standard Oil Company went on its way unmolested. During those years, I had, as the boys in the back room would say, a swell racket. I was rewarded with honors, medals, promotion. Looking back on it, I feel I might have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was to operate his racket in three city districts. We Marines operated on three continents. So that's what he thought of his own career looking back on it in the mid-1930s. And as far as I know, he's the highest ranking uh, military officer in American history to ever go so outspoken and so public against – the whole military industrial complex. And obviously war is a racket is probably the most famous thing that he produced during that, that period of his life after retirement. And you can read it very quickly, by the way, it's online. I will link to a copy of it at tomwoods.com slash 791. Yeah. You know, I, I actually assign it as one of the primary source documents that we read in my U S history two classes every semester. So every student who comes through my class reads war is a racket. What's the year that it was released? Um, I want to say it was 35 thereabouts, give or take. That sounds about right. Okay, if you look at it, it, it's got just a small – it's got five chapters. War is a racket. Who makes the profits? Who pays the bills? How to smash this racket? And to hell with war. So when he says war is a racket, what does he mean? I mean what basically does he mean by that? Yeah, he means it in the sense of the way we speak of racket with organized crime. Now, in that essay, he never defines it really explicitly. He kind of says something sort of vague about it's something that's not what it appears to most of the public or something like that. Yeah. But he doesn't give a, a, a definition, but it's pretty clear by what he says throughout the essay that what he means by racket is the same thing when we talk about like the mafia and you know racketeering laws and that sort of thing that's what he means it's a way of obtaining money um, dishonestly and or illegally unethically and so on all right i checked it and you are indeed correct 1935 okay so war is a racket in that we're you know we're presented with all these uh, romantic flag-waving ceremonies and songs and patriotic this and that, and that conceals the true nature of what's actually happening. He has an exceptionally cynical view of war. He really thinks it, it really ultimately comes down to dollars and cents. Yeah, yeah, he's very much – um, viciously attacking the both the military industrial complex. He doesn't use that term because that term I don't think was really around yet in the 30s. But he's he's criticizing that all the companies that make absurd inflated profits off of providing goods for the military. And as he mentions in the essay, and this hasn't changed at all to this day, a good number of the goods that these companies make either are shoddy and don't even do what they're supposed to do, or they're they're made for wars where they're not applicable. So he mentions like uh, American troops getting sent to Northern Europe in World War I and the government making sure that they buy lots of tropical uh, sorts of equipment, you know, that you would want if you were operating in Ecuador or something. And that sort of thing is, we well know, you know, continues to this day. If anything, it's, it's greatly larger than it was in his day. And he's really... What what really helps is that this is a guy of unquestioned military credentials and like no one could call him some sort of hippie or some sort of, you know, left wing pinko or whatever, even though he did have a, a few leftist streaks in him. But this is a guy, an unquestioned war hero, and he's telling like it is because he knows it from the inside. And also I, I should mention he he, he mentions in, in a lot of his other speeches and essays and things – Aside from just the profiteering on supplying the war, um, he also – and this came up in the quote I read a few minutes ago. He also was very perceptive in understanding that oftentimes the interventions themselves were on behalf of some sort of corporate interest. So it's not a coincidence that uh, Team America's forces invade a particular country if, say – um, Standard Oil or United Fruit or some Wall Street bank or somebody has massive um, investments and massive uh, resources and so on in a country that appear to be perhaps under threat by something that's going on in that country. So he understood that angle of corporate welfare as well. You know, I know back when I was in college and uh, I was literally, 
I mean literally surrounded by communists on the campus. I ran into communists selling a communist newspaper every single night I went to the dining hall. So I was acutely aware of their presence. And they would criticize U.S. foreign policy. They would talk about the 1950s and Guatemala and United Fruit, and they'd say the U.S. government is just trying to prop up the profits of investors. And I think there were conservatives who felt like, well, if if communists are saying something, I therefore have to say the opposite. So it's good for the U.S. government to go and prop up investors in other countries if they run into troubles with that country's government, whereas my view is – That's one of the risks you run investing in other countries. There's a possibility that hostile forces could come to power. That's the chance you take. Those are the dice you roll. And I think that's implicitly what Smedley Butler's trying to say. Yeah, I agree entirely. Um, And I think that it's important in a way to emphasize the notion that this idea, and certainly I, I think it is appropriate to connect it back to Alexander Hamilton's ideas, the idea that the government should help the wealthy and that the interests of the wealthy elites and the government should be the same. Well, really all that is is a form of welfare. It's simply welfare to those who are already wealthy. And you know, we might object to all forms of welfare and redistribution across the board, but to me there's like something particularly disturbing. Like if you think that a kid getting, I don't know, food stamps or something is is wrong, um, shouldn't it be even more kind of grating, even more disturbing when millionaires and billionaires are essentially getting uh, welfare from the state. I mean, to me, it seems like if anything, like if, if we're going to uh, prioritize and triage, like which forms of welfare are the most disturbing and unjust, maybe we would start with with the sorts of things that Smedley Butler is talking about. And we can get to like milk subsidies later. Yeah, that's sort of been my view, indeed. So who indeed, according to Chapter 3, who pays the bills? Well, of course, the nation as a whole through taxes. One thing he doesn't mention, but he was a a career officer in the Marine Corps, not an economist, so we can't expect him to, to pick up on everything. I'm pretty sure he doesn't mention inflation, although obviously in modern wars, inflation is one of the main ways that they pay for wars. Wasn't it something like a third of the cost of the Vietnam War at the end of the day was really paid for by inflation? So he doesn't mention that, but he does mention the taxes. He mentions people getting conned into buying war bonds that aren't even good investments at the end of the day. And then, of course, as a guy who spent a lot of time actually in combat zones leading men into danger, he's particularly perceptive and sensitive to the the men in the front lines and how they pay the costs more than anybody else and of course their loved ones back home as well he talks of course about all the suffering that the common frontline soldiers go through the risks the possibility of death the possibility of maiming and he also talks a little bit about i forget i forget the exact words he puts it into but he clearly understands the basic idea of what today we would call ptsd that People who – even people who come through the war physically intact can oftentimes be warped psychologically or whatever you want to call it for the rest of their life. And he talks about also the nation as a whole, another way the nation pays for it, and this I give him credit for being very perceptive on, is through propaganda, that the nation – is so propagandized in modern wars that it kind of warps the psychology of the nation. And I guess he doesn't put it this way, but it seems like it it seems inevitable that it would set the stage for people to be keen to go to war again next time because they've already absorbed so much propaganda during the last war. And he talks about the whole notion that everyone thinks that God is on their side. And of course, the in World War One, the German government is telling the German soldiers that God's on their side. And um, he really kind of digs into that a bit cynically and skeptically. Now, then when we get into chapter four, how to smash this racket, he swears off disarmament conferences and signing petitions and having an international day of peace or whatever. He says, well-meaning but impractical groups can't wipe it out by resolutions. And he may have in mind from 1928, the famous Kellogg-Briand Pact, in which the signatories all pledged not to use war to settle their disputes. He just says that you put that next to 
giant dollar signs and, uh, you know, those little pieces of paper are going to come in second place next to the giant dollar signs. So then, therefore, what is, in his view, the only legitimate hope you have to smash this racket? Right. And his his views on this sort of thing, I think, are pretty close to something like the America First Committee. Um, I think at the end of the day, he's a populist. And there are some elements of his belief system that seem to be kind of left populist and some elements that are kind of right populist. And towards the end of his life, kind of the second half of the 1930s, I think he was, in terms of his views on foreign policy and military policy, more and more sympathetic to the overall ideas of something like the America First Committee, though I don't think he – I think he died before that that group really got up and running. But he advocated for a strong defense – for the United States. He was no pacifist. He was no anarchist. But he really, really wanted to try to make it so that America's defenses would be strong, but really not geared towards or capable of long-range offensive operations, which are precisely the sorts of things that he had done as a Marine officer for decades. The Marine Corps was always involved in these quote-unquote small wars in places like Latin America and the Caribbean and Southeast Asia. Of course, not didn't seem small to the people who lived in those countries, I'm sure. But he wanted there to be a strong defense that was not capable of going – long distance overseas and being really used for offense. So he advocated certain uh, restrictions and rules regarding what kind of naval craft we would have. He advocated other reforms designed to take the profit out of war. He basically wanted laws that would make it impossible for corporations to make inflated profits off of off of war because he thought that would then take away the incentive for corporations to try to lobby politicians to have a more aggressive foreign policy. He, uh, one of the proposals he supported was to – if the state is going to go to war – the last thing before it's possible to happen is that a sort of plebiscite is taken, but only amongst those who are actually active in the armed forces. And I think that's an interesting one. I, we, we can probably imagine that if they did that today, if that was a rule, and assuming they didn't just find a loophole and get around it, of course, that maybe some of our recent wars wouldn't have happened if they had to actually take an honest poll of the active duty military and say, hey, guys, how keen are you on jumping into Syria? You know, um, might have gone down in flames, I think, considering how many of those people donated money to Ron Paul back when he was running. So those are some of his reforms. Uh, there, there are others that aren't coming to mind. I mean, my my basic conclusion on those reforms is that some of them are are interesting and might make things slightly better. On the other hand, I'm too much of a cynic to think that, A, the sorts of reforms that he's advocating are likely to ever be passed by the very politicians who benefit from things the way they are. And B, that if by some miracle some of these things did get passed, I don't have much faith in these people to abide by this, uh, to, to abide by these restrictions, considering how masterful they are at getting around every sort of rule and reform and limitation and so on that's been imposed on them. It's so going right back to the Bill of Rights itself. Well, agreed. Now, this, uh, this is a short, as I say, this is a short little book. And my understanding is it was excerpted in Reader's Digest, which got it a fairly substantial audience. I don't know what lasting effect it had other than as something of a cult classic these days, and I don't know how many similar things have really been done by people in the military. I mean, you do get some, you know, some occasional, uh, after a war, you get some occasional regrets about it. What do you think is the significance of Smedley Butler in the grand scheme of things? Well, I think his, that he should have more significance because – to the average mainstream person, he's simply not well known. To people like you and I and, and kind of the sorts of people who listen to our shows, a lot of people at least basically know who he is and probably are familiar with War is a Racket, whether they've actually read it all the way through or not. But the general – and there are some anti-war leftists, I'm sure, who are also familiar with it, no doubt. But the general kind of mainstream public 
the vast majority of them don't even know who Smedley Butler is. And that's kind of what I was trying to do with that episode of my podcast and also what I was trying – what I'm trying to do every semester when I um, have my, my students in U.S. history read it and then we have a discussion about it the next class is – and, and in a larger sense, this is kind of what I'm trying to do with my podcast in general is to bring up these stories and and figures and points of view and so on in history that have been, whether by accident or deliberately in some cases, I think, neglected, kind of left in the memory hole. Because Smedley Butler was a contemporary of a lot of the most famous generals in American history – Douglas MacArthur, um, Eisenhower, Patton, like these are roughly the same generation of generals. He was right up there in terms of how decorated he was and all these sorts of things. But very few people just walking around today who aren't in our circles have any clue even who this guy is. And part of it, I think, is that he retired in the early 30s. And so he was not still in active service when World War II happened. And that's, of course, where a lot of these guys like MacArthur and Eisenhower really made their fame. And part of it and, – and, of course, he died in 1940, actually, before Pearl Harbor anyway. So part of it is kind of that, I think, it, why he's not better known. But part of it, I think, is deliberate that what he said and did – during the last decade or so of his life when he was an outspoken anti-war, um, anti-military national complex activist. In the last few years of his life, he was very vehement against America getting involved in World War II. I mean he was really radical against that, very outspoken on radio, talking to veterans groups, all these sorts of things. And so I think part of why Smedley Butler has, as far as the mainstream's concerned, been consigned to the memory hole is – that the kind of mainstream court historians don't really want to talk about a highly decorated general who went off the reservation this much. They're willing to talk about Eisenhower and say, yeah, isn't it interesting, his farewell address and what he said there. But they don't want a guy who retired and spent an entire decade railing against the American military system and war profiteering and all this sort of thing because it ruins the narrative. So I'm just trying to, with my podcast and with my classes, kind of bring this back up to people's attention and go, isn't this kind of important that a guy who was this decorated and accomplished of a military officer actually had this to say at the end of his career? And um, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just mention that when I cover War is a Racket in my classes – most of the time, the students who are the most kind of excited by it and just over the top in agreement with what he's saying are veterans. I have a lot of veterans coming through my classes, and they tend to be the most receptive to and sympathetic with Smedley Butler's message in War is a Racket. And so because of that, I think to veterans in particular, this guy who you know clearly is one of their types of people, who was not an armchair general, who was a rough and tough Marine, highly decorated in combat, his – words, his way of putting it has a lot of pull with people who otherwise might not be receptive to that message. Well, he's a fascinating guy. People will enjoy his punchy prose. Man, that prose comes right off the page, right in your face, especially when he's dripping with sarcasm about the patriotism of the war profiteers saying, oh gosh, what a sacrifice they made to you know double their profits during the war. Wow. You know, that's what these young kids did going getting their limbs blown off is nothing compared to this. I mean, he, yeah. he's just, you know, it's just devastating to, to read. So I'm linking to that. I want to lead to a link, of course, to profcj.org as well as dangeroushistorypodcast.com. Those both get you to the same place? Yes. All right. And check out the list of episodes that you'll find there. And you're going to be amazed at the variety of topics that are covered. It's, it's going to be your new favorite. Well, I don't want to say it's your new favorite podcast. It might be tied for your favorite podcast. Let's put it that way. But it's going to be a resource you're going to be glad to know about, that all these episodes exist and that more are being produced all the time. There are a lot of other topics you and I could talk about. Let's make sure and do that sometime soon. Hey, that sounds great. I'm game. All right. Well, a few things to tell you. One of them is unique, or a couple of them are unique to Black Friday. It is today, as I record this, Black Friday, 2016, November 25th. 
And that means two things. First, it means Liberty Classrooms having its best deal of the year. It's a steal. If you are a victim of educational malpractice, you will be cured by Liberty Classroom. Courses designed for adult enrichment, although homeschoolers also have used them with profit, that you can listen to on the go at any time. You can learn the history and economics they should have taught you but didn't dare or didn't know and master this stuff. It's fantastic, and we keep on growing. More and more people, more and more courses. We keep on growing. It's fantastic. Be a part of it. The Master Lifetime Membership includes all those videos I whined about producing, remember, all, a couple years ago? It's every single one of them, almost 400 additional videos. And, of course, they're also in audio format, so you can listen on the go. But all the things I did for the Ron Paul curriculum are also thrown into Liberty Classroom as a bonus for people who get the Master Membership. So a ton of great stuff. I meant it for adults as an adult enrichment sort of site. But as I say, a lot of homeschoolers have used it with great profit, so there's also that. And I bet you know somebody on your list who could use a lifeline to sane professors. So whether it's a gift for yourself or for somebody else, now's the time to get it. It's, a tr it's tremendous. Don't even consider not getting it. Don't even consider not getting it. You're going to be like a kid in a candy store when you see everything you get. So libertyclassroom.com, that's the first thing. Second thing is, you, you know how I tell you all about starting your own website, and there are all good reasons to do that? Well, Bluehost on Black Friday has the best deal ever, $2.65 a month. Come on. That's ridiculous. So grab that. They're going to be doing that all through Cyber Monday, so the whole weekend. So if you're hearing this a couple days later, you still have a chance to grab hosting at that crazy rate. Get it through tomwoods.com slash publicity so that you get all my great bonuses if you use my link to get your hosting. These bonuses are so great, you wouldn't want to do without them. So check, check those out at tomwoods.com slash publicity if you are on the fence. Hop off that fence when it comes to starting your own website. Then thirdly... I want to tell you about yet another website started by a listener. And this one is melbasvoice.com, M-E-L-B-A-S, voice.com. And what you'll find is that Melba is actually a voiceover specialist. She's a tremendous voiceover talent, and you can hear samples of her voice. So if you need voiceover work, well, consider looking into a Tom Woods Show listener. Check out melbasvoice.com. Free samples, testimonials, everything you could want to make a decision. melbasvoice.com, linked at tomwoods.com slash 791. She gets that shout out because she indeed used my link, and that is the key to the whole thing. All right, enjoy your weekend, everybody, and I'm telling you, over the weekend, if you haven't done it yet, there's going to be a little voice in your head. You're going to be saying, you know, I feel like I've forgotten something this weekend. I feel like something I'm supposed to be doing, and I just can't think of what it is. That is the Liberty Classroom voice in your head. Get over there to libertyclassroom.com. See what we have to offer. Join us. You'll make me happy. You'll make all my faculty happy. you make Kevin Goodsman happy, Brian McClanahan happy. you make Brad Berzer happy. Isn't that great? I mean, Brad Berzer is happy all the time, right? So he's going to be on overdrive with happiness. Check out libertyclassroom.com. I'll see you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.